Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, Brenton USA Hunting Rifles, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to another edition of the Outdoor Magazine show right here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network. More than 30 AM and FM stations across the great state of Michigan talking about the great outdoors, the outdoor lifestyle here in the great state of Michigan. It is something that means so much to so many people in our state. It's not a hobby. It's not a pastime. It's a way of life. Is it an addiction? Eh, Sometimes. Is it a good addiction? I think so. I think anything that can get us outdoors, outside, in the fields, in the woods, on the water, away from the stress of our day-to-day life, maybe even away from the electronic devices that we carry in our pocket all the time, although I don't know of a hunter who can sit in a turkey blind or a tree stand for more than a couple of hours without taking a look at his phone. (laughs) That's just life today. But this outdoor lifestyle is such a big part of our history and tradition. And this is a great time of year, isn't it? Springtime in most of the state. For me, it's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, I've been looking forward to turkey season. I love turkey hunting. Turkey hunting, walleye fishing, bear hunting are my big three. And, and don't ask me to choose between them. But this time of year, I'm thinking about turkey hunting. And it looks like at this point, as the sun comes up over the horizon from the east, on the opening morning of turkey season, and that first bird gobbles from the roost, and they fly down and start wandering around, I'm not going to be there to greet him. I think I'm going to be in an airplane. <laughs> how, how did that happen? Now, we've got a, a family a wedding, actually, in the Keys that we're heading down for. And I'm excited about that. I'm looking forward to it. I kind of wish it would have been a different weekend. But I've got a long season. I've got ZZ, which runs from April 23rd all the way through the end of May. So I've got plenty of time. And that's one of the benefits of if you live in the southern part of the state and you can find private land to hunt on, ZZ is wonderful. But it is, uh, it is turkey season. I've been getting ready. I've been shooting my bow. This year I uh, decided to go back to a crossbow. I've talked about this before, but if you're new to the show or didn't hear this, I, I had been hunting with a recurve for a couple of years. Love a recurve. Love the challenge of it. Love the simplicity of it. Love, love the just everything about it. Absolutely everything about it. But if you hunt with traditional archery gear, you have to be extremely committed. And you have to spend the time to do it and do it right and practice and be confident and proficient with the tool that you're going to use. I think we owe that to any critter that we're pursuing. And last year at the end of the season, uh, end of the uh, turkey season. I'm out there with my recurve. I mean, this is like the last couple of days of the season. And I had a bird come in and fortunately he didn't give me a shot. He almost did. I mean, he was right in my lap, but he was hiding behind a pine tree and wouldn't come around the tree. And I'm almost glad of that because deep in my heart, deep in my soul, deep in my brain, I wasn't confident that I could make a quick, clean, humane killing shot. And that was not a good feeling. There was a time when I was shooting enough, several times a week, 
that I, that I did have the confidence. But life gets in the way, even for a guy like me, whose job it is to do outdoor things and talk about outdoor things. You know, I just didn't have the time, or maybe, maybe more accurately, I wasn't willing to make the time to practice and shoot that recurve as much as I needed to to be confident. So when it came time for the fall bear season up in White River, Ontario, I switched over to a crossbow. And, there, you know, obviously I feel very comfortable, very confident in that. So that's what I'm hunting with this year. I've been shooting that. It's a Darton, uh, Darton Toxin 100 RD. I love Michigan-based products. Uh, I am fascinated. I'll tell you this. I am fascinated by the Ravens. I'm fascinated by that new 10-point that shoots over 500 feet per second. But I love this Darton. Uh, shooting mechanical broadheads. Um, I think if you're bow hunting for birds, a mechanical is a very good choice. Not for traditional archery gear. I would never recommend a mechanical broadhead out of a recurve or a longbow, but certainly out of a, a, a compound and a crossbow. I think they're I think they're great. Uh, so the way I do it is I've got uh, well, I've got several of these uh, primal tree stands, Wraith 270, see-through blinds. If you are a ground blind hunter, I would encourage you to check them out. They change the way you will look at ground blind hunting because you can see out and the critters can't see in. Changes the way you'll look at ground blind hunting. So I'll have that set up. I'll put a couple of decoys out in front of me. And I'll wait and see what the birds want to do. If they got, start gobbling, talking, I'll talk back. If they're quiet, I'll just call a couple of times just to let them know I'm there, and then I'll shut up. I turkey hunt more like deer hunting than traditional run-and-gun, shotgun-style turkey hunting. But I love it. It's been effective for me, and, you know, it works out. Speaking of shooting, uh, I told the story last week about my grandson, Carter, using my old single-shot 20-gauge that I got for my birthday when I was, I don't know, 10, 11, no, Christmas, when I was like 10, 11, or 12. And he was using it to shoot trap on his uh, high school trap team and doing actually quite well with it. But it's a, it's a full choke. It's a hunting gun. It's not a skeet or trap gun. We put him in that gun because, number one, just the safety, the simplicity, uh, the size. He's not a very big-framed kid. But we got looking around, and, and as I rummaged through the gun safe, I found another one in the back of the safe that I think is going to work out better for him. It's an old Remington 20-gauge, but it's an Upland bird gun. So we went out last weekend, and we patterned those two shotguns side by side. By, what patterning is is you put up some kind of a target. For us, it was just a white sheet of paper, and you shoot into it, and you see what the pattern of the shot looks like, You know what the spread is. And then, and then we took the other gun, the semi-auto, the Upland Bird gun, longer barrel, and shot that, and it was obvious it was a more open pattern. Carter handled it very well. It's actually not too big for him, and that open pattern, I think, is going to help him out a lot. So we'll see. Uh, coming up here in a couple of days, he's got his next shoot, and I'll be cheering him on over his shoulder, and we'll see how he shoots that gun. Speaking of shooting... Um, I've got a Brenton AR-style hunting rifle that I had ordered a while ago. I just got the phone call. It's done. Now, I haven't picked it up yet. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested, very excited in this. I am primarily a bow hunter, but when I look at this, this Michigan-based company that makes extremely accurate hunting rifles on the AR platform, that's got my attention. It's a 350 Legend. So what I've been doing in preparation of this, even though I don't have the gun, every time I go by an ammo store, I stop and I pick up a box or two or whatever they will let me of 350 Legend ammo. And that's, I, I think that's good advice. Anything in the outdoors right now, probably anything anywhere, if you think you might need something, a piece of gear, a tool, equipment, and you think you're going to need it, and you find it in a store, buy it now. Because it may not be there in a few months. That's what all my friends in the sporting goods, in the outdoor world are telling me. They say, Avery, tell your listeners. Now, I realize they have a vested interest because they're selling products, but they want their customers to be happy. If you find what you're going to need later in the year, if you find it now, not a bad idea to buy it now. Because with all these supply chain issues and the prices and everything going up, 
you're probably better off to have it now, and that way you know you've got it. And that's what I'm doing with the ammo. I'm not hoarding ammo, but whenever I can find a box of 350 Legend, that's what I'm buying. Specifically, Hornady 170 grain and Federal 180. Those are the two that I've had, you know, people that I respect have been sending me that direction. They said those two uh, work very well. But I haven't shot it yet, so I don't know. I think what we'll do here uh, sometime in the near future is do a Wednesday night live with that gun, maybe on the range, hopefully on the range, shooting it so you can get a feel for what I'm talking about. Uh, what else? Have you started to pick up crawlers yet? Pick up your night crawlers for the trout opener, walleye opener coming up? <laughs> Talk about history and the tradition in the outdoors. Picking up night crawlers, getting ready for fishing season is part of that. But does anybody do it anymore? A lot cheaper than buying them, that's for sure. And a lot more fun, too. That's an adventure in itself. You go out there after dark on a warm, rainy night with a flashlight. Uh, just, for kids especially, it's a real, real adventure. Coming up on this week's Outdoor Magazine show, after the break, Adam Bump, a DNR wildlife biologist, talking about turkey hunting here in Michigan. Then Elliot Schaefer of the Michigan Wildlife Council with an update on their Here for Generations campaign. In hour number two, we're talking fishing with the man himself, Mark Romanak of Fishing 411. Nick Green of MUCC checks in this week's Ask Avery segment, also talking about fishing. And in hour number three, Corey Mitzrick of a Northern Edge Food Plots. Yes, it's the food plot season, too. As if you didn't have enough to get done, it's food plot season as well. And then, of course, wild game chef extraordinaire Dave Miner will join us as well. That's all coming up this week right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in port here on WPHM 1380 AM. You can hear us in the on the other side of the state in Muskegon, WKBZ 1090 AM. And up north, north of the bridge in Newberry on WNBY 1450 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Rapid River Knives. Speaking of north of the bridge, Rapid River Knives, a company that makes high-quality Handmade knives, obviously. I've got a Rapid River knife in my pocket right now, as I always do, but they also make skinning knives, fillet knives, kitchen knives. Uh, check out the website, rapidriverknifeworks.us, rapidriverknifeworks.us, and you'll see what I'm talking about. You can order online. There are also several stores around the state, including Jay's Sporting Goods, that has a nice collection of uh, Rapid River knives. Or better yet, when you're in the Yoop, stop by the showroom and check it out. It is absolutely amazing. Very, very impressive. And you can buy a knife there and have it engraved while you wait. How cool is that? Rapid River Knives, RapidRiverKnifeWorks.us. Well, right now, of course, this weekend, as you're hearing this show, we're talking about turkey season. The turkey season opens the 23rd. Uh, I told you my season might get a, a little, a, the start of my season may be delayed a couple of days, but you can bet I will be out there as soon as I can be. I love turkey hunting. And to, to me, turkey hunting is interesting because when I was a kid growing up on the west side of the state, there was no turkey hunting in Michigan. For you younger folks, you're saying, how, how can that be? I never saw a turkey when I was a kid. I was an adult before I saw a bird. And these days, it's one of the biggest things going on in the Michigan outdoors, certainly in the springtime. Adam Bump is a DNR wildlife biologist. He is the Upland Game Bird Specialist, and he's with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Adam, welcome back. How are you? Good, Mike. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. So let's talk about turkey hunting here in Michigan today. Uh, how would you characterize it? I, I hear a lot of people say they don't think we have the number of birds in our state that we did years ago. I, I, is there a decline in the population, Adam? So it's a great question. Across the country, a lot of states have been seeing some declines in populations, and a lot of turkey research right now is kind of focused on trying to figure out why that might be. In Michigan, we don't have population estimates, but the data that we do use that tracks broad trends in populations is saying that right now it looks stable. But given the trends that we're seeing everywhere else, we're trying to look at how we can enhance some of our information about turkeys so that we can monitor for declines. 
I think most of the declines people are seeing might be local scale. So you might be used to seeing a whole bunch of turkeys near your hunting area one year and then another you don't see quite as many. And that's probably more of a, a natural just um, switching of areas that turkeys are using at a, at a more local scale. You bring up a very interesting point, Adam, is you guys in Lansing have to look at this, uh, for the most part, from a statewide perspective. Yet we as hunters, we only care about the section we're hunting or the farm we're hunting or the county that we're hunting. Exactly. And that can be, I mean, that's a real decline for someone that I've shot a turkey every year in this spot and I haven't seen one for a mile or two around me. Um, it's a it's a cause for concern. That's where some habitat management practices might um, be able to impact that or just recognizing that something for turkeys changed a little bit in your area and maybe the next year they'll be back or it might be time to try to look for some new areas where you might be able to uh, call in some birds. How far will birds wander in an average day when they come down off the roost? What's their what's their range? So they're they're usually not traveling huge distances, but it, it wouldn't be uncommon for them to move a mile or two from a given location. Um, and then during throughout a whole year, their movements can be a little broader than that. They might shift where they're spending time in different seasons. But when you're looking during the spring season, they're remaining fairly tight, and I wouldn't expect them to travel that far um, during the springtime. Uh, and the regulation is in the springtime, one bearded bird. Now, it's interesting that a bearded bird could actually be a bearded hen even. That's right. Yep. It's it's, it's a it's a low number of hens that have them, but um, every year we get bearded hens that are shot. And what's the thinking, Adam? Why, from a biological perspective, is the springtime hunt uh, focused on male birds? That's to try to help ensure that we're not negatively impacting the population. So the removal of males tends to um, retain the, all of the hens for breeding and nesting and raising of young. Um, adult males can breed multiple females. Um, females only need to be bred once to be able to lay their full clutch. So um, the primary reason has been to, to make sure that you're protecting the population. Some of the current research that is looking at potential causes of declines in other states is suggesting that the timing of removal of even males in the spring may be an important consideration. So that's what a lot of states are looking at for the future of spring turkey hunting is making sure that the harvest even of male birds is being done in a way that doesn't hurt populations. So what are you saying, Adam, that, that, in, that it Maybe some of these states, maybe even Michigan, are looking at moving the season back a little bit to make sure those birds can breed first? That's one possibility is waiting until the most of the hens have um, have actually started their nests before the majority of toms are taken. So I think the jury's still out on, on some of those actions. But you'll see other states, some of them have reduced their bag limits if they have a multiple bag limit. Um, and then... There's a lot of research looking at the timing of breeding and the behavior of breeding to just, again, make sure that we continue to manage turkeys in a way that is what's best for the population, but also giving hunters the opportunities that they want. Um, maybe a weird question, but can, will jakes, if they get the chance, can they effectively breed? They can, but the, socially, the, probably the opportunities are very limited. Yeah. Yeah. The, the whole the whole um, interaction of turkeys, especially in the spring, to me is fascinating. You've got you've got hens that actually absolutely decide what's going to go on, uh, go on, just like a doe in the fall. You've got these big strutters that push their weight around and they're so vocal. And then you've got those jakes that are like a, a gaggle of, uh, of teenage boys don't know which end is up. It's it's fun to watch. Yeah, I think that's I think it's great. The dynamic. Like you said, if you get a group of turkeys that are working your decoys or working you when you're calling, it's just fascinating to watch that behavior between those three different groups. And, and even just the power dynamics between different uh, toms is pretty interesting. It, it can probably get hard for diehard turkey hunters sometimes to um, – stay focused on the task at hand and just spend some time watching. I think that's why you get a lot of um, longtime turkey hunters that like taking out new turkey hunters. It gives them an excuse to sit and watch turkeys 
while someone else is focusing on shooting that bird. Yeah, well, there aren't many critters in the Michigan woods that you can have an interaction with like turkeys. I mean, on the right day, even if you make a bad call, a bird's going to respond, and, and that is, that in itself is addicting. Yeah, that in in almost every state, the the key to turkey hunter satisfaction is less about killing a turkey and more about hearing a turkey and having a turkey respond to your calling. That that is one of the most satisfactory parts of turkey hunting for most turkey hunters. Let me ask you about a uh, number of tags, number of licenses. Um, you know, since you can, since people can go in and buy leftover tags who didn't already have a license, there is a certain number of hunters who say, look at it, if there are leftover tags available, why can't I, as a successful hunter who's already taken a bird, if you're going to let somebody else shoot that bird, if that tag's available, why can't I go buy a second tag? You're right. The, the second tag discussion has been around for a really long time, and it's something that um, we we like looking at the possibilities of providing more opportunity when we can. But we also want to make sure that everyone has a fair opportunity, and we want to make sure that, like I mentioned before, Michigan's populations don't appear to be declining like most of the other eastern states. And we want to make sure that it stays that way. So that second um, bird idea is something that we really need to be thoughtful about to make sure that before we implement it, um, we know it's not going to have any negative impacts on both hunter satisfaction from everybody that's getting just their chance at one bird and from the population as a whole. The fall season is a whole different, whole different ball game, though, isn't it? Yeah, the fall season is totally different. The, the primary objectives there are really um, giving opportunities for people to handle turkeys that m- may be causing some kind of problem, and then just to provide a little bit of fall fall hunting opportunities. The, the style of hunting, everything about it is different than spring. Uh, so a uh, uh, hen, when do they usually start to nest? Uh, I mean, are, are, there, are there some hens already out there sitting on nests, or is it going to be a couple of weeks yet? There might be down in the southern parts of the state, there might be a few hens that have started laying eggs, probably not sitting on a nest yet, but might have started laying a few eggs. We're getting right around that time frame where they would start doing that. So what is this process? They lay an egg once a day, is that right? That's what I've heard. Yep, most most of the big uh, upland game birds are one egg a day. Then the, So they'll do that until they reach their full clutch size, which is typically in the... 12 egg neighborhood somewhere in there and then they'll start sitting on the nest which is incubating so the eggs don't start developing until she starts sitting on them basically 24 7 and then for most of those types of birds that size it's 23 28 days somewhere in there where um the the, uh, young start hatching does that hen leave that nest at night to go roost or does she stay right there all night She'll stay all night. So the, they'll get up every once in a while to eat and do things like that, but it's usually very short time frames, and then they're right back on the nest. And the eggs need to stay at a relatively consistent and fairly high temperature in order to survive, so she can't, she can't afford to be awesome for very long. We're talking with uh, DNR wildlife biologist Adam Bump here on the Outdoor Magazine Show. We've got to take a break, but when we come back, uh, several more questions for Adam, including a follow-up on this uh, topic he just brought up there. If that hen is sitting on that nest all night, isn't she just a prime target for predators? I mean, we got coyotes all over the place. We got fox. We got you know. You think that uh, you think that that alone would make our population go down? Again, I think I think the Michigan Turkey Program is a great conservation success story because again, there were no birds when I was a kid. And now you look, I think we've got birds in, what, every county in the state, maybe? I mean, some more than others, obviously. It's, it's a critter that'll drive you crazy. You fall in love with them. There have been days when I've come back in from the turkey woods and heard gobbles but didn't see anything. I walk in the door, and my wife Denise says, how'd you do? I said, I didn't see a bird. She said, listen, I just drove down the road, and I had to stop to let two strutters cross the road in front of me, and you sat out there for four hours and didn't see anything? <laughs> They can be so dumb and then so smart, and that's why I love them. More with Adam Bump of the Michigan DNR, michigan.gov slash DNR, coming up after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. You 
can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in uh, in the thumb in, uh, in Sandusky on WMIC, 660 AM, 95.3 FM. You can hear us in St. Joe on WSJM, 94.9 FM. And north of the bridge in the Sioux on News Talk 1400 WKNW. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by the Linwood Beach Marina and Campground. Linwood Beach can be your year-round Saginaw Bay fishing destination and your mid-Michigan tracker and Angler Quest headquarters. Linwood Beach is like Angler Quest Central. They were the first dealer in the country to offer to carry Angler Quest boats. They're one of the biggest Angler Quest dealers around. And when you go to the marina right now, you will see a lot of Angler Quest boats. But you don't have to have an Angler Quest to take advantage of the marina, the boat launch, and the campground there. Check them out online at linwoodbeachmarina.com. That's linwoodbeachmarina.com. A great uh, marine shop as well, too. If you need some work done on your boat, the guys at Linwood Beach can help you out. Right now we're talking turkey, though, with Adam Bump. He's a, a wildlife biologist for the Michigan DNR, the website michigan.gov slash DNR. Adam, before the break, uh, you were talking about uh, these hens sitting on the nest all night long. Doesn't that make them just great, uh, a great target for predators? You certainly can have that happen. So you can have, we have a lot of ground nesting birds that are that are out there and have made a pretty successful go of it. So they, they have strategies. Um, turkeys are big, so that it takes some effort to, to take a hen down. A hen will abandon the nest if they can't uh, hide well, and they're pretty explosive flyers. But you certainly do lose some hens and probably more frequently lose the nest to, to predators. So it definitely can happen. So if, if a hen does have to abandon a nest or if we get a really cold, wet spring and it just the, 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 the eggs don't take for whatever reason or, you know, a problem that, will, will she nest again? Will she try again? Yep, they will often try to do um, nest attempts, sometimes even a third time, depending on when they lose their nest and how you know, healthy they are and able to try to, and able to lay those eggs. But they will do re-nest. You'll notice in the fall um, or late summer, you'll get hens that bring their broods together and they travel together and you'll have these um, big gangly poults and you'll have these little itty-bitty ones and that's from the the re-nesting attempts are successful sometimes, and so you'll see the different ages of um, young turkeys in the late summer. So uh, a jake is basically a year-old male bird. Um, when they when they get to be two, I mean, is that considered an, an adult bird? At that, at that point, they've got spurs, they've got a beard, they're strutter, right? Yep, yep. When they get to two years of old age, that's when you're... That's when most guys are looking to take that that bird when they're around two, um, and then the the uh, the Jake is going to have that little short, usually around four inch beard or so, not much going on when in the way of spurs. They're not as actively strutting. They'll they'll fan sometimes, but by the time they get to two, they're uh, they're a big bird. If if not taken out by a predator or a hunter, how long will a will a turkey live? Uh, I think you're going to see them probably similar if you have chickens. Usually, if you're taking care of them right, they'll they'll make you know the six to eight year time frame, and probably some of them can make it a little longer. So if if they're out there and they're dying of old age, they're probably up there getting close to a decade old. Wow. Do we have turkeys all across our state now, Adam? Yeah, we have turkeys just about anywhere that you could possibly have turkeys. And even then, they push the boundary sometimes. So we have them at the edge of their their ability to live. The cold weather and especially deep snows of the Upper Peninsula and some parts of the northern lower are pretty stressful for turkeys, but we still have populations in some of those areas too. I wonder if the biologist years ago who brought birds into the Mayo uh, Fairview, Fair Grove, Fairview area, if they ever would have dreamed how successful that program ended up being. You know, Turkey's reintroduction had a lot of starts and failures before it finally was successful, and then it took quite a while before the populations took off. I bet they'd be pretty amazed if they could see what we have on the landscape now. What, what was it a matter of, just getting uh, enough birds in the right location to make it take off? It was getting enough birds in the right locations and also probably finding the right birds. Some of the earlier reintroductions used um, birds that 
probably had some farm stock, not pure um, wild genetics. And I think it was really getting those birds that were adapted to our conditions in the right numbers for them to just take off. Well, and and these days, I think looking at the stats, Michigan, you know, not top three, but we're one of the top turkey hunting states in the country now, aren't we? That's right. I think uh, the National Wild Turkey Federation ranks us fourth in terms of harvest of turkeys <laughs> in the nation. That's pretty impressive when you look at the, you know, the Iowas and the Kansas and the Pennsylvanias and stuff that we're right in there. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's pretty amazing. We're, it's a great state. and a lot, We have a lot of people coming to Michigan to turkey hunt and certainly a lot of residents that love the fact that turkeys are doing so well. Will you get a chance to get out at them or do you work so closely with the birds you don't want anything more to do with them? Oh, no, I'll, I'll get out. I have a small flock that haunts me on my property every <laughs> once in a while. I can see it from where I work. So um, I'll definitely make it a, an attempt to harvest one this year. All right, Adam, good luck to you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Adam Bump of the DNR, Michigan.gov slash DNR, talking turkey here in Michigan. If you haven't turkey hunted, but you just like to be outdoors, and maybe even like to hunt, I would strongly encourage you to give it a try. There are leftover licenses in many parts of the state. I should have talked more with Adam about that, but they're out there. Go to the website, michigan.gov slash DNR. It's a newly revamped, newly remodeled website. Just follow the menus through. You can buy them online. You can go into any license agent and give it a try. You don't have to be an expert. Get yourself a cheap call. Go out there, make a couple of squawks, and see if you get a response. And if you do, you will be hooked. Take a break here on Outdoor Magazine. Welcome back to Outdoor Magazine. My name is Mike Avery. So glad to have you along with us as we as we celebrate this outdoor lifestyle for three hours each week on more than 30 stations across the great state of Michigan, including WZTK in Alpena, 105.7 FM, in Battle Creek, WBCK, 95.3 FM, And in Cairo, two stations, WKYO 1360 and WIDL 92.1 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Boning Archery. Michigan-based Boning has been a leader in the archery industry. When did they start? 1946, I think. That's when Rollin Boning invented Feraltite. Now, Feraltite uh, was, I think it still is, a product to glue broadheads to uh, arrow shafts. But back then they were uh, aluminum and even wooden arrow shafts early on. These days, Boning continues to innovate, come up with new products. Think, uh, think blazer veins and the new iterations of that. Boning makes everything for bows and arrows pretty much except bows and arrows. Uh, check them out online at boning.com, B-O-H-N-I-N-G.com. As I am in the woods this spring for turkey hunting, I will have boning products, uh, both when I was shooting a recurve and now as a crossbow hunter, uh, boning is part of my gear uh, when, I'm, when I'm bow hunting for sure. Uh, we had intended to have someone from the Michigan Wildlife Council on to talk about the Here for Generations campaign. Uh, some kind of a glitch. We can't get in touch with them, but that's all right. I want to. T- I want to talk about these folks anyway. If you, well, if if you're like me, um, this outdoor lifestyle is something that maybe we take for granted. You know, we grew up in families that hunted and fished. We taught our kids to hunt and fish. Uh, teach our grandkids to hunt and fish, and we we assume, we hope, we pray that at least in our families, this tradition of the outdoors will continue on for generations. That's not a given. Now, it depends on where you live in this state. If you live in the UP, you're like, well, this is, this is what we do. This is who we are. Nobody can ever take this from us. And I get that. Even in where I live in the central part of the lower, I mean, it, it's, it's still the outdoor lifestyle is pervasive. A lot of people hunt. A lot of people fish. But when you start heading south in the state, to the southwest corner of the state, the southeast corner of the state, where the population is, where the bulk of the people are, you have a lot of people who have never been exposed to hunting or fishing or shooting or trapping. It's not their fault. They just, their families didn't do it. 
their friends don't do it, the opportunities might not be there. So those people, they're not necessarily anti-hunting or fishing or shooting or trapping, but they're ignorant to it. And I don't mean that in a negative way. They just don't know about it. Yet, those are the people who make the decisions for the rest of us when it comes to legislation, when it comes to going to the polls, when it comes to voting on the issues that we love so much. We're outnumbered. So it's very, very important to get those people, and by those people I mean those people in the geographic parts of the state, those people, that group of people who have not been exposed to the outdoors, to let them know what's going on. The Michigan Wildlife Council was formed several years ago to do that with a, through a campaign called the Here for Generations campaign. The website is hereforMIOutdoors.org, hereforMIOutdoors.org. And I think they're doing a great job, and, and their research proves this, that they're doing a great job on reaching these people. They started out very slow, very subtle, you know, with billboards and radio spots and TV spots, just talking about you know, the outdoors is a beautiful place, and come on out and look at the wildlife. And they gradually, over the years, have kind of wrapped up the, uh, ramped up the campaign to take it to the point where, hey, if you love the outdoors, if you like watching the birds and the squirrels and the deer, thank a hunter or an angler for this, because we, hunters and anglers, are the ones who pay for this. It's amazing the number of people, even hunters and anglers, who don't know where the funding for wildlife and conservation comes from, it is primarily from us with our license fees, with our dollars, with the money we spend on hunting and fishing gear. And Lord knows there's a lot of that, isn't there? Never enough, but there's a lot of that. So I think the uh, Here for Generations campaign and Michigan Wildlife Council is doing a great job. Look at, it, look, look at it this way. There are two ends of the spectrum. There are those of us who are addicted, committed to love the outdoors, hunting and fishing and shooting and trapping. And then there's those, there are those people on the other end of the spectrum who are blatantly anti-hunting. They're anti-hunting, they're anti-farming, they're anti-fur, they're anti-trapping, they're anti-everything. They're just, I, I, don't, I don't get their way of life at all. We will never convince, convince them, and they will never convince us. But what about those 80% of the people in the middle? The 80% who are non-participants but are not pro-hunting or anti-hunting. They just, they don't care. They don't know. They're, again, they're uneducated. Uneducated is probably a better word than ignorant. That's who the Michigan Wildlife Council and the Here for Generations campaign has targeted. And you know what? That's who you and I, as hunters and anglers, need to target as well. If you've got somebody in your circle of influence, your neighbors, your friends, people at church, who don't hunt or fish, talk to them about it. Take them out hunting or fishing. Expose them to it. So at least they know. So the next time a vote comes up where they have to make a choice, okay, do I vote for this outdoor adventure, this outdoor pursuit, or against, at least they have some information. At least they have a background. At least they have a frame of reference. The website here for miOutdoors.org, here for miOutdoors.org. We'll take a break for the top of the hour. When we come back, we're talking fishing with Mark Romanak of Fishing 411 right here on Outdoor Magazine. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, Brenton USA Hunting Rifles, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to our number two of this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network, heard on more than 30 radio stations across the great state of Michigan. Okay, I've established the fact that this is a radio show, and I say that because I believe the best way to listen, if you can, is on your local radio stations. For one thing, the uh, broadcast stations get the content of the show before the podcast is uploaded. 
So I really want to support uh, you know, my 33 affiliates across the state. So again, if you can, listen there. But if you can't, if your local station doesn't carry the Outdoor Magazine show, or if it uh, doesn't carry all three hours of the show, isn't it nice to know there's a podcast version available? Podcasting is huge these days. Everybody has a podcast. Well, guess what? I've been doing podcasts for a long time. And you can hear the podcast version of the Outdoor Magazine radio show anywhere that you get your podcasts from, including my website, Facebook page, YouTube, even on YouTube. So regardless of where or how you are listening, I do thank you very much. Also, as long as we're talking about podcasting, I'll put in a blatant uh, plug for the Outdoor Magazine Podcast Network. Each month, I produce podcasts for Offshore Tackle, Angler Quest Boats, Primal Tree Stands, and Polar Craft Boats. In fact, today when we get done here at the radio show, we will record an Angler Quest podcast. You can hear that at anglerquestpontoons.com. And a, a, a Polar Craft Boats podcast as well. You can hear that at polarcraft.com. So check those out. Uh, we uh, always have great guests, great um, subjects. In fact, Mark Romanak has uh, joined us on the uh, Offshore Tackle podcast before. And you know that name, right? He's one of the most well-known, one of the biggest names in fishing in Michigan and in freshwater fishing across the country. Over the years, he has built up a name and a reputation, not just with his Fishing 411 TV show, not just with his Fishing 411.net website, but also the Precision Trolling, the Troller's Bible, now available as an app. If you are a troller, you need to know how deep your lures are going, and there is no better way to do that then with the Precision Trolling app. And Mark Romanek's with us on the Outdoor Magazine phone line now. Mark, my friend, welcome back. How are you? I'm doing great, Mike. It's uh, always good to hear your voice. It's always. I, 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 yeah, I, I love talking with you. I mean, we've got such a history, so many years together. Um, that, yeah, it, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor when I, when I can get with you and you've actually got time to do something, especially this time of year. Man, it's a busy time, isn't it? It, it is, but uh, lucky for you, the weather sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't so consider not... myself lucky because of that. <laughs> uh, normally, I'd be on the water a lot this time of year, but as you know, um, boy, I tell you, a uh, month of April is uh, it's pretty sporadic when it comes with weather, so it's sometimes a little difficult. So right now, we're waiting for better conditions. And you, with what you do, you are completely at the mercy of Mother Nature. You have things that you need to get done, but you can't do it unless the weather and then sometimes the fish cooperate. Well, and it is exactly true. I mean, um, it's the great equalizer in fishing. I mean, the fish can be biting great on Monday, and if the weather changes Tuesday, um, it can be a big zero. So, I mean, the reality is that's just what fishing is. And when you understand that and take it into consideration, um, there's really no sense beating your head against the, the wall if you don't have to. And I realize some guys have to. I was watching the National Walleye Tour on the Detroit River here a little while ago, and and uh, earlier in the month, and those guys were fishing in brutal conditions. And my heart went out to them because they had no choice. They had to fish, but they had to fish in cold water, cold, windy weather, rain, snow, muddy water. It doesn't get any worse than that. And so they had to do it. Well, I'm in a different situation. I, uh, I wait for the conditions to get a little bit better before I go out there, and uh, it makes it a lot easier to be successful. Do you miss tournament fishing at all? Yeah, you know, especially the first few years because of the camaraderie. You know the fellowship that goes on with those guys, and it's not just the fishing. It's after you're done fishing and going out to dinner and, you know, and hanging out with your buddies, that kind of stuff. So I did miss that, um, but I quickly came to realize that um, the tournaments were fun uh, and enjoyable experience, but they weren't the most productive way to spend my time. And uh, when I put tournaments behind me and went full-time writing and full-time um, in the media business, then things started to happen in a positive way, in a very quick way for me. A dumb question and a basic question, Mark, but what makes a person a good angler? What's the, what's the key? What's the trick? Well, I don't know, maybe tenacity, um, you know, your willingness to keep trying despite the fact that, can, you know, the conditions aren't good or maybe that the fish just aren't biting or maybe you just haven't figured out where or how best to catch them. Uh, if you're the kind of person that gets easily distracted uh, or easily discouraged, uh, fishing may not be a very good hobby for you because there's going to be a lot of distractions. There's going to be a lot of disappointments. Um, but when you figure it out, when you finally figure it out, um, that reward that you get, that feeling of satisfaction is hard to beat. So 
Um, you know, fishing is that for me. It's a, it's a challenge every day. And as many years as I've done it, I still don't feel like I figured it out. Um, I still get it handed to me from time to time. And every once in a while, I figure it out. And I'm successful. And I feel very good about that. Well, you just answered my next question. I was thinking at this point, I was wondering if when you head out on the water, if you, when you launch your boat in the morning, are you confident that you will find fish and the fish you're looking for in good number? Well, it depends on whether we're fun fishing, uh, which doesn't happen a heck of a lot these days anymore, or whether we're fishing for television. If we're fishing for television, I'm very confident. And uh, the reason for that is that I put in my time and I pre-fished ahead of time. We don't just hit the water cold turkey and expect to shoot a television show. Um, We'll fish for a day or two and get it figured out, Um, check the weather to make sure the weather is going to be cooperative. Um, And then we typically go right to fish that we know are going to be there um, so that we can be successful and get the job done. Um, When we're fun fishing, we don't necessarily have that luxury. So, you know, we hit the water cold turkey very often just kind of like everybody else does and in that situation to be successful you just have to have the mindset you need the running gun if you're not finding them where you thought they were going to be you just got to abandon that and keep looking uh, until you do find them so we move around a lot doing a lot of graphing a lot of searching with sonar before we ever break out the rods fun fishing that's an interesting term coming from you because I would, I guess I would wonder, a guy like you who spends so many days on the water, uh, sometimes even you, not in the best conditions, sometimes when the fish don't want to cooperate, I would think when you had a couple hours off, a day off, you'd pick up a set of golf clubs or something like that. Oh, hell no. Have you ever seen me golf? <laughs> <laughs> I, I am absolutely a horrible golfer. Um, I, uh, I, I definitely, in fact, I've had one of these things I've said for years is that golfers are people who don't fish. And, uh, and I'm a classic example that I, I am really bad at golfing. And, uh, and so I keep uh, trying to stay focused on fishing. And, yeah, I do get a chance to fish for fun. Uh, i got some buddies that I enjoy fishing with, um, people I've known my whole life, my family, um, my brothers. And, um, I like to fish with my brother quite a bit, so whenever I can find time. So it's, uh, yeah, um, there is some fun fishing, and it's just not as much as I'd like. And I think you guys just celebrated a milestone, too. We had um, your son Jake on the Offshore podcast talking about this. So what, what was that? It was a pretty big deal. Yeah, it was our 200th episode. 200. And, um, and so 16 years in television um, in uh, 200 episodes is, is, kind of a, is kind of a milestone. And not a lot of television shows last 16 years. And uh, so we feel very fortunate to, uh, uh, to have been able to be in that position. And hopefully um, there's another 200 ahead of us. We'll see. I know the show has evolved over the years. You guys continue to make it more interesting, uh, more visually interesting, more entertaining, more educational. But how has the fishing world, how has the resource, how has fishing in general changed over those 16 years? Well, it depends. You know, some of the fishing has gotten much better. Uh, Some of it has has struggled a little bit. Um, You know, walleye fishing has never been better in the Great Lakes region than it is currently. Um, when we want to get a walleye show, it's actually pretty easy to do so on places like Saginaw Bay or Lake Erie, Detroit River, Lake St. Clair, the St. Clair River. All of those are pretty much a given. We're going to be successful when we go there. Um, but other so, you know, types of fishing has not necessarily been that great. Um, as you know, our salmon fishery is in kind of a downward spiral right now. And when I say ours, I'm talking about the Michigan fish. I'm talking about Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Salmon fishing is struggling. Um, there's no question about that. So we do still fish here for salmon. Um, but we have put a lot more effort into being successful, uh, not necessarily a one day on the water and get it done kind of thing. It might take several days to get it done. Um, the other thing that we do a lot for salmon fishing is we should travel and, uh, and travel to other ports where we know fishing is going to be better. Maybe the Wisconsin side of Lake Michigan or maybe Lake Ontario where they stock a little bit more and where the fishery is in better condition. Speaking of travel, one of the times I had you on here recently, you talked about your desire to go out west to the Columbia River and actually fish walleye. Did you, did you make it out there? I didn't, but Jake did. We just finished the show. <laughs> What's wrong um, with that story? Well, it just kind of the way it worked out in the scheduling, and also the guest that we had set up happened to be a really good friend of Jake's. And so you know that that camaraderie that goes on and that banter in the boat between people um, is really important to how well a show comes off. And uh, um, basically it was Austin Mosier uh, who hooked us up out there, and he's a really good friend of Jake's. And those two have a tremendous rapport, a great banter back and forth. And so, and I know it was on Jake's bucket list too. So 
Uh, the old man kind of uh, bowed down and, and let Jake have that one, and uh, they came back with a tremendous show. Unbelievably good fishing out there. No, I will look forward to seeing that. We're talking uh, with Mark Romanek of Fishing 411, the website fishing411.net, fishing411.net. Got to take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine Show. When we come back, we'll talk more uh, fishing with Mark. also want to talk about trolling. You know, people think of trolling, uh, people who are casual anglers sometimes think of trolling as the lazy man's way to fish. And it can be. I'll admit, there are days I go out there on Saginaw Bay in the Angler Quest and I put my feet up and I light a cigar and I just kind of zone out and have fun and enjoy the weather. But if you are truly a hardcore troller, it is far from easy and you're always working we'll talk about that and precision trolling knowing how deep your baits are coming up after the break right here on outdoor magazine you can hear the outdoor magazine show in sheboygan on Big Country Gold, WCBY, AM and FM. That's 1240 AM, 100.7 FM. You can hear us in Flint on Sports Extra, 1330 WTRX. And you can hear us in Ludington on News 97, 98, 98.7 WLDN. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Brenton USA Hunting Rifles. AR style, highly accurate, tough, dependable hunting rifles that could change the way you hunt. They're made in Lansing just down the road from the governor's office. Check them out online at BrentonUSA.com. That's BrentonUSA.com. I have a 350 Legend on order. I haven't picked it up yet, but it's done. They teased me with it. They gave me a phone call the other day, so guess what I've been doing? Every time I drive by an ammo shop, I've been picking up a box or two of 350 Legend. I'll let you know more about that once that gun comes in. Talking a little fishing now, though, with Mark Romanek of Fishing 411, fishing fishing411.net. Mark is one of the guys behind the Troller's Bible. If you troll, it's imperative that you need to know how, how, how deep your baits are. I mean, if you don't, what are you doing out there? Up until, well, several years ago now, there was no really good way of doing that, but then they came out with the Troller's Bible, precision trolling. And again, Mark Romanak is one of the guys behind it. He's on the Outdoor Magazine phone line uh, right now. Mark, you have saved so many anglers over the years so many hours of frustration. Uh, you've got to be really, really proud of that. I mean, there, I don't know how many are out there. I'm sure you do. But anybody who trolls relies on that app. Well, you know, we are really proud of the product. But I don't know exactly how many people are using it. It's pretty hard for us to judge that. Um, back in the day when we sold books, we knew exactly how many books we were selling. Um, that was an easy one. But apps are different. Well, a lot of people don't realize is, is that when you buy the trolling app, you're not actually buying it from Mark Romanak directly. You're buying it from either the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. Hmm. And and while we get feedback from those, you know, as far as for what the sales and stuff are, um, it doesn't come in numbers. So we'd have to do the math in order to be able to figure out exactly how many um, apps that we're selling. Plus, it's not just buying one version of the app. There's multiple versions that people buy. Some people just buy a few lures. Some people buy the Lifetime. Some people buy versions. Some people buy the Crappie app. So it's, it's very complex. So I don't know how many we're selling, um, but I do know that uh, the numbers are going up every year, um, that uh, the return on investment is very good, and we're just simply couldn't be happier with the way it's worked out. How does the app work? I mean, I've, I've got it. I know. I use it. I love it. But for somebody who has never seen this, never heard of it, never used it before, what should they – how do they use it? Well, there's a couple of factors that are important to understand when you're trolling. Uh, there's variables that you can manipulate, that you can control. They're going to change the diving depth of your lure. And one of those, of course, is line diameter. Um, and so it's impossible for us to test every single line diameter that's out there with every single lure. So what we do is we set a standard. Um, our monofilament testing is done with basically 14,000 diameter line. And that could be a 10-pound, could be 12, 14, even 16-pound test line, depending on the brand that you have, you know, happen to like using. So we use a 14,000 diameter monofilament. We also test all of our crankbaits on a 10-4 um, braided material. Um, we use Fireline, um, but it could be another braided material. They're all quite similar these days. So we give two dive profiles. We give a dive profile on monofilament, and we give a dive profile on braid. And um, and so your job as the angler is to pick one of those, um, spill it up to your reel, and then 
The thing that you can manipulate is your lead length. And obviously, the more line you let out, you know, you let out that you play out behind the boat, the deeper a lure is going to dive. So by manipulating the lead length, you can is what we call the feedback, um, which is the picker wheel on the on the app. It's called feedback. You can set your feet back, and then it'll tell you your feet down. So, say for example, you let a, <clears throat> I don't know, let's say a hot and dot out 100 feet. It's going to tell you exactly how far down that hot and dot will run at 100 feet back. Will a bait continue to dive infinitely, or is there a maximum depth it's going to reach regardless of how much line you let out? No, they continue to keep going down. The problem is is you meet um, what I call a point of diminishing return. Um, You can keep letting more line out, and yes, you do get a little bit of additional depth, but it's so minor and so meager that it really doesn't justify itself by how much more line you're letting out and how much further you have to reel the fish. And um, this is particularly true with monofilament because there's stretch associated with monofilament. And um, if you do hook a fish, that stretch makes it harder to get the hooks in the fish. So if you're fishing with a braided material, a fuse line or a braised line, um, you can you know, keep letting out a lot more line than what we test on. We test out to 200 feet. You could let out 300 foot of line, and you would still go deeper. But again, the problem is reeling a fish that great distance becomes an issue because um, – you run the risk that that fish is going to wear a hole in its mouth, um, the hooks are going to tear free, and you're going to lose that fish. My rule of thumb, Mike, is that I typically do not like to run leads any further back than 100 feet. That's my personal rule. If I have to let a line back more than 100 feet to reach the depth, I'm more likely going to add weight to the line, like a snap weight from offshore, uh, to achieve that. So should I be running mono or braid? Well, it's personal. I I still run mono, but I know a lot of really good trollers, guys I really respect that are running braid. And there's pluses and minuses to both. Mono is inexpensive. You can afford to put um, mono on all of your reels without having to mortgage your home. Um, Braid is much more expensive in that regard, but it lasts longer. So um, I put mono on my reels, but I also do it twice a year. The average guy probably can get by with just once a year. If you're putting braid on your reels, it's a pretty good chance, even if you're an avid fisherman, you can get by two or three seasons without having to re-spool. And so there's an advantage there. So it really comes down to what do you want to do personally. Um, I'm a mono guy, but I don't, uh, I don't discourage people from doing braid. It works very well. Does speed play a role in depth, or is that strictly uh, um, uh, determine what the action of the, of the bait's going to be? Well, it's a little of both, Mike. Um, you know, the action of the lure obviously is going to be impacted by speed. If you slow down, uh, the action of the lure is going to be deadened. Um, if you speed up, it's going to be personified. Um, and so speed really is a triggering element. It definitely helps trigger fish. Um, so we experiment with speed in order to find just that right speed at any given day, that, you know, that action of the lure that happens to be triggering bites on that given day. But as far as for depth, if you're talking about a floating crankbait, a traditional lure that floats at rest and dives when you pull it, um, speed is not going to influence its depth. Um, it's going to go to the same depth at one mile an hour than it would be at three miles an hour. So speed doesn't really influence on its depth. Now, it gets a little bit you know, sticky here because if you add any weight to that lure, such as a snap weight or a keel sinker or whatever you might be doing, um, now it's a different story. Weight makes the lure sink, and anything that sinks is speed dependent. And what I mean by that is if you go slower, they go deeper. If you go faster, they don't go quite as deep. And so when you understand those dynamics, um, you can start to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Well, and and here's something that I didn't understand until you brought it up to me. I guess I used to think, you know, I'd look at your dive curves in the old in the old book. I'd look at the dive curves and I'd see the I'd see the curve you know, kind of dipping down. And I was thinking, in my mind, I was thinking, okay, this is what my, my, my line is doing. It's making a curve down from the surface, from my boat to the bait. And you said, no, Avery, that's not the case. Most of your line is actually on the surface, and then it dives down to the bait the last few feet. And that, that is a distinction that I think is important to realize. It is true. And um, if you've ever fished a planer board and you got one planer board line tangled over another and you couldn't understand how come that happened, it happens because most of your line is floating at the surface. doesn't matter if it's a braided line or a monofilament or even fluorocarbon. Um, if you've got 100 foot of line out to your crankbait, um, 80% of that line is at or near the surface. Only the last 20% or so is actually angling down into the water towards where the bait is at. And so because that line is floating at the surface, if you're not careful when you're bringing one line in over another with planer boards, it's very easy to cross lines. 
So, and we've all done that. So then when I'm running my offshores, I run OR12s uh, with tattle flags usually. Um, should I put my, my I'm going to call it deepest just because it's got the most line out. Should I put my deeper baits to the outside or to the inside then? I believe that the best way to do it is to put your deepest lures closest to the boat. So I start with my high lines. I set them on the furthest outside board, and then my progressively deeper lures go in the middle boards, and then my deepest lure is going to go on the inside. That way, if you catch a fish on that outside high line as you're reeling it in, it's going to be higher in the water column. It should travel right over top of those other lures. And um, you don't want to have uh, staggering lead lengths if you can you know, if you can avoid it. Now, don't get me wrong. It's okay to have a 40 and a 50 and a 60-foot lead, that kind of stuff, but you don't want to have a 40 and a 150 um, because if you have a longer lead length, um, you're clearly going to catch that floating line on the surface if you're not careful. So um, definitely try to manage your, your lead length so they're relatively close together if you can. But if you've got, say, say your inside one is running 75 back and your outside run is 30, thinking that most of the line is on the surface, aren't you still going to snag that inside one when you bring that high line in from the outside? Because it's floating no. on the surface. Yeah, that's true. But what ends up happening is that when you hook a fish on that outside line, that fish comes right to the surface. And uh, I know you recognize this because you've caught a lot of walleyes in Saginaw Bay. Most of the time when you're fighting that fish, you can actually see them floundering on the surface behind the boat. So they come up because of the pressure you're applying to them. So that allows you to slip over top. But the important thing is patience. If you catch a fish on an outside line and you immediately start reeling on that fish, yes, you'll do just what you said. You will run that line right into that other line on the inside and you'll tangle the two lines together. But if you fight that fish very slowly at first, giving the board an opportunity to sag back, um, eventually what will happen is that board will pass the other lines and will be almost straight behind the back of the boat. Then you can start reeling harder on it and bring it up the throat of the boat where there are no other lines to get in the way. So what I always tell people is you got to have a little patience. If you're anxious and you start reeling on that fish real fast when you first hook it, you're probably going to reel that into a no line. And we're almost out of time here, but one thing that cannot be uh, talked about enough is the importance of actually tuning your bait so they run true so we can, we can use the info on your dive curves and know it's accurate. And uh, that's something that most people shy away from. They don't like to tune crankbaits. In fact, I see people that won't buy certain brands of crankbaits because they're afraid they're too hard to tune, <laughs> and, and I get it. Um, but, uh, you know, there are tools that will help. An offshore tackle manufacturer, something called the Easy Crankbait Tuner. It's a specially designed pliers that has a slip clutch on it. And, uh, and while it's a little bit complex to explain, it operates very simply. Once you become accustomed to using that, anybody can tune a crankbait. It doesn't matter if we're talking about a little crappie bait or a great big musky bait. The Easy Crankbait Tuner will tune all of those lures. Mark, where do we see the Fishing 411 TV show? You can find it on Sportsman's Channel. You can find it on World Fishing Network. Um, if you're streaming, you can find it at MyOutdoorTV.com, and you can find it at Wired to Fish. And how do we get how do we get the uh, app? The app is uh, at um, at the Apple App Store or Google Play App Store. And look for what Precision Trolling. Yep, just search Precision Trolling, and uh, it'll come up. It's uh, one of the best-selling apps in the country, so trust me, if you, uh, if you search <laughs> You'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark, always a pleasure. Keep up the good work. I'll send people to the website, fishing411.net, fishing411.net. Always a pleasure to talk with Mark Romanak of Fishing 411. We'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine Show. When we come back, we'll talk with Nick Green of MUCC, and then this week's Ask Avery segment, and it happens to be a fishing-related question. That's coming up yet in hour number two of this week's Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Houghton Lake on the Twister 92.1 WTWS. You can hear us in Lansing on WILS 1320. And you can hear us in Traverse City on WTCM 580 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by VersaSkins. Just change your skin for the season you're in. Michigan-based, family-owned VersaSkins is a company that makes high-quality hunting clothes. With an innovative twist, you can snap on and zip on a different outer shell to change your camo pattern from blaze orange to snow camo to waterfowl camo to uh, upland camo. 
Uh, really, really neat concept, and it can save you some money. Go to the website. You'll see what I mean, versaskins.com. That's versaskins.com. They have uh, clothing in sizes up to 6X, so they can handle just about anybody. Uh, really an innovative product. Great people, great company. Check them out online, versaskins.com, versaskins.com. Tell them that the big guy, Mike Avery, sent you. Uh, it's, it's no secret that we record this show during the week, right? You hear it on the weekends, but we record it during the week. And right now, we are pulling Nick Green, the chief information officer for MUCC, out of a meeting. Nick, I apologize, but I sure appreciate your time. How are you? I'm doing well, Mike. It's uh, starting to look like spring here in Lansing. Oh, like my bit, goodness. So. <laughs> yeah, it finally, finally feels great. And I hope I'm not... Well, listen, maybe I'm pulling you out of a meeting that you want to be pulled out of. I don't know. What do you got going on? Yeah, we're uh, kind of just getting ready for the spring season here in Lansing. Uh, so happy to be happy to be stepping out of the meeting and talking with you. Um, you know, we have an NRC commission meeting this week. And when folks hear this, that will have happened. Um, so it's expected that they will vote through some elk regulations that will really not change uh, much of what much of what we've known to have been the elk season in Michigan for for its existence, um, and that's really kind of the only really business order uh, on the agenda for the NRC this week. Nick, I know you're uh, you're an avid bird hunter, uh, but if I remember right, aren't you a fly fisherman too? Are you looking forward to next weekend's opener? I am. So the uh, last Saturday in April is a very hallowed day for me, my family, uh, my friends. Uh, I'm from northern Michigan, so I will be up hopefully on some trout streams. Um, I'm also a woodcock bander, so this is kind of the time of year that, um, you know, we start to utilize our, our permits and our work with the department to try to find woodcock and band and do some, some citizen conservation science. Tell me more about that. How does that work? Just not, not just anybody can go out and do that, right? No. So this is required to be permitted through the uh, United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and our department actually handles that permit, uh, and then we are sub-permittees through our department. So you have to go through a mentoring program. Your mentor has to kind of watch your dog, uh, make sure that you know how to handle chicks. You know, safety for the chicks is of the utmost importance. This isn't for dog training. This isn't for, you know, just being out there to walk and have fun. You know, we are out there with a specific purpose. Uh, and, and if you're not careful, you can do harm. So we have to make sure that dogs, humans, everyone is being safe. That's right. It's a federal permit because these are uh, migratory birds. It is, yep. So we banned them uh, just as they would with ducks, terns, osprey. You know, we ban lots of things in Michigan, just like, like woodcock. Um, you use your dogs to find them, but then how do you capture the birds? If I remember right, you put up a mist net and they fly into the net. Is that still the case? No, so that was how it used to be done, uh, is that you would try to flush the bird into a mist net. But Andy Ammon, who was our biologist before Al Stewart, um, he actually developed a way to use a pointing dog. Sometimes you could catch the hen without her actually moving. Um, sometimes you flush the hen and then the chicks stay there. So you actually never even catch the hen. You're just looking for those four chicks. You work quickly, safely, efficiently. You put bands on them. And, and most of the time, many times when you're walking out, you actually hear the hen come back to her chicks. It's pretty, pretty neat. And what's the purpose of the band, Nick? The purpose is to help us try to kind of determine where migrate where woodcock are migrating so when they get harvested a hunter will or or killed in some other fashion or or just incidental death the band gets reported and then we say okay where did that woodcock end up uh, and that's what bands are used for on multiple species is trying to figure out we can know where they were banded about how old they were and then how old they were and where they they died and that's especially important for woodcock because we've lost about 50 percent of the population in the last 30 to 40 years. Wow. Um, well, I know there's a natural cycle, but 50%, that's not part of that natural cycle, right? Habitat. Um, you know, it's the same thing that rough grouse uh, face. That's why folks call rough grouse the bellwether, is they're dependent on young successional, early successional aspen that continues to move north. Uh, woodcocks struggle with the same same habitat loss, but then they also have to migrate. So you think about states like Ohio, Indiana, you know, that aren't doing any management for woodcock, they got to fly through a whole state um, on their way south, you know. So there are, there are things they're, they're combating when they're out of our hands at, at the state, in the state of Michigan. Uh, so it's going to take a really a federal and a collaborative approach. Where do these woodcock, our Michigan woodcock, where do they end up in the wintertime? 
generally in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so folks, you know, you can follow really from the tip of the Keweenaw in the United States all the way down to Louisiana um, as they make their migration. And there are people who do that in Michigan. Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, those folks, even down in Missouri and Arkansas, I've heard about hunters who, who 20 years ago, 30 years ago, chasing woodcock was kind of their thing in the fall. And now they're lucky if they find one or wow. two a year. Well, I appreciate what you're doing as far as uh, conservation effort, uh, efforts for Woodcock specifically, but uh, in general, Nick. So I'll let you get back to your meeting. Appreciate your time. Nick Green, Chief Information Officer for MUCC, the website MUCC.org, MUCC.org. If you want to save 25% on signing up to become an MUCC member, why not? Join it. Great conservation group. Go to the website MUCC.org, MUCC.org. Use the promo code MIKE, all caps, M-I-K-E. And save 25%. Always a thank you to Nick Green. We'll take a break here on the Outdoor Magazine Show when we come back this week's Ask Avery segment. And it's about fishing. That's coming up right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Manistique and WTIQ. That's 1490 AM, 95.3 FM. You can hear us in Tawas and WIOS, 1480 AM, 106.9 FM, twice each weekend, by the way. Let's go back to the U. Let's go to uh, Escanaba, the Riviera of the North, where you can hear us on WCHT, 600 AM, 95.3 FM. The uh, Ask Avery segment is brought to you each week by my friends from Security Credit Union. Security Credit Union loves to work with outdoorsmen and women, and they can help you with your next outdoor adventure. Check them out online at securitycu.org. That's securitycu.org. The way the Ask Avery segment works is this is your chance to ask a question of me or something you want me to pass along to MUCC or DNR, something that's been bothering you, something you want to know about. Maybe you can't reach these people, and and possibly I can. The way you get those questions to me is to send me an email, mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com, mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. And I've had some very good questions sent to me in the last few weeks, and I I have put those out to the DNR, and I'm waiting for responses. So while I wait for those responses, this week's, I admit, is kind of a, Maybe not as earth-shattering as the answers that we've got coming up here in the next couple of weeks. But this one is from Sammy. And Sammy sent me an email to Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. She says, I haven't fished much, but my fiancé is a big fisherman, and he's getting me started. I like it, but I don't know much about it yet. His parents have a cottage on a small lake up north, and we plan to fish a lot this summer. Excellent. She says, just curious, what kinds of fish have you caught, and what's the biggest? And I got thinking about this, that uh, in my years on the water, what, what would those be? Uh, the, it has to be the biggest fish I've ever caught was a marlin. And that was a 100-pound marlin down off Cabo San Lucas at the tip of the Baja Peninsula. This was before Cabo became cool. This is before Cabo became a destination point. This is before the Cabo Wobble Bar was there. When I was there, there were actually still dirt streets in town. And Cabo was, a, was a, a, a getaway and a marlin fishing hotspot. So I did get to fish marlin there, a 100-pound fish, which is not a big marlin, but it's the biggest fish I've ever caught. Uh, for my beloved walleye, uh, biggest fish I ever caught was a 31-inch walleye, um, but it, didn't, it only weighed about 8 pounds. It was a summertime fish. It was in August, and this was many, many years ago. I actually... Uh, the fishing was real slow, and I, I, I thought, well, I, I'm getting marks. This is way back, right? Those big marks on the bottom must be big walleye. Let's, let's put something down there. So I put a big lip uh, crankbait down there and was dragging it, bouncing it off the bottom, and came up with this big 31-inch walleye. And I actually got that one mounted, um, and this is like back in 86 or something like that. I got it mounted because... Looking at the timetable, this would have been one of the first fish stocked in Saginaw Bay as they started to, to, to replenish that resource. So I thought, okay, it's a big fish. It's cool. I'll get that one mounted. As far as kings, I've never broken the 30-pound mark on a king salmon, a Chinook salmon. 
as much time as I spent out there, I I never could. I our, our biggest fish was I think twenty eight pounds. Ne- a beautiful fish, but never broke the thirty pound mark on kings. Uh, I the only master angler fish I think I've ever caught that I documented was a white bass, seventeen and a half inch white bass, which is a pretty good size white bass. Uh, caught, maybe it was fifteen and a half. I think it was fifteen and a half. Um, caught that out of the Titabawasi River years and years ago while we were up there walleye fishing. Uh, also, coho, of course, caught coho over the year, browns, steelhead, uh, lake trout, brooks, brookies, of course. I got started fishing with brookies, brook trout, in Cedar Creek. I know it's Creek, but I'm going to call it Cedar Creek. Going down there um, with a, a, a bait casting reel, some hip boots, and some night crawlers that I had spent the weeks before picking up in anticipation of the opener of the trout season, wading down there, fighting my way through the chubs to get into a brook trout, you know, trying to hit that magic, what was it, seven-inch fish? Occasionally catch a nine-inch fish. It was like, man, that thing's a monster. But I cut my teeth fishing brook trout. It was so much fun. Uh, Pink salmon, never caught a Michigan pink salmon, but I have caught pink salmon up in Alaska where the fish were so thick that anything you threw in the water was going to get a hit. The locals up there didn't really like pink salmon, uh, but they were fun to catch. Caught a uh, dolphin, not a, not a flipper-type dolphin, but a mahi-mahi. Where do we catch those? I think I was off uh, Florida, maybe. Um, I, oh, going back to Alaska, I have caught a halibut up in Alaska as well. Very interesting fish. Not a huge one, but big enough to put up a good fight and sure good eating. Muskies, of course, uh, Lake St. Clair caught muskies, carp everywhere, suckers, catfish, pike, bluegill, crappie, bass, white perch, bullhead, dogfish, smelt. The fish I've never caught, a sturgeon. That's going to end. An Atlantic, never caught a splake, never caught a whitefish, never caught a grayling, never caught a cisco or a herring, never caught a burbot, never caught a grouper, never caught a char, and never caught an Asian carp. And there are many, many more that I haven't caught as well, but that's kind of a rundown. Uh, Thank you, Sammy, for that question. Uh, You can reach out to me, Mike, at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Some some more newsworthy Ask Avery segments coming up as soon as I get some answers back from the uh, DNR. And again, thank you to our friends at Security Credit Union for making each week's Ask Avery segment possible. Check them out online at securitycu.org. At securitycu.org. We'll take a break for the top of the hour. When we come back, we're talking food plots and Wild Game Cooking with Chef Dave Miner. That's coming up in Hour 3 of this week's Outdoor Magazine. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, Brenton USA Hunting Rifles, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to our number three of this week's Outdoor Magazine show right here in the Outdoor Magazine radio network. Yeah, three hours. Three hours every week we are here in this studio talking about the great outdoors, the history and tradition of hunting and fishing and shooting and trapping and all things related to that. People say, how do you come up with enough enough subject matter, enough topics, enough people to cover three hours every week, Avery. You know what? It's, re- it's really not hard. There are so many things. I, I Granted, there are some times of year easier than others, but there are so many things going on in the outdoors here in our state year-round, so many people who are experts, so many people who are passionate, so many different seasons, so many different activities, so many different critters, so many different fish. There's always something going on. And now this time of year, as if morel mushrooms, as if upcoming walleye seasons, 
upcoming trout seasons, turkey season. If that's not enough steelhead fishing, suckers are running. If that's not enough to keep you southern Michigan coho, if that's not a Detroit River walleye, if that's not enough to keep you busy, let's add one more thing to the plate. It's getting to be food plot season, too. Now, you might want, not want to think about this right now, but come a few months down the road, you're going to be glad you did the work now to get the food plots ready. Corey Michek is with uh, Northern Edge Food Plots. When I called up, and, and here's some background here. I used to have Nick Percy of Killer Food Plots on the show all the time, and Nick unfortunately passed away. So I called my friends at Jay's Sporting Goods, Bill Hahn in particular. I said, Bill, I'm looking for a food plot guy. I'm looking for a Michigan-based expert, somebody who can help me and our listeners know more about food plots. He immediately said, Corey Michek. And Corey's with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Hey, Corey, I appreciate your time. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Tell me a little bit about you, Corey, a little bit about your background. How did you get to where you are now? Well, about 18 years ago, I just had an idea. I was, I was out doing my first food plot, and I actually had a hand rototiller, a rake, and that's how I started. And... What happened is I planted it, and I overplanted it. And that's the biggest thing that people do in Michigan is they think the more seed, the better. And in this situation, it wasn't. And I couldn't see the seed. And I started thinking, I was like, what can I do for individuals across the state of Michigan to to help them, to come out with an affordable seed blend, a blend that you can actually see when you lay it down. And and I just wanted to, to be part of everybody's success and and help them. And that's just where, where it started from. Cool. And I had the ability at Standish Milling to put it all together. Um, and I started with one blend and it was four radishes and then I just kind of took it from there and it just continually growed year after year and thanks to all the support for all my local Michigan people. Uh, thank you. 18 years ago, Corey, I mean, man, you were one of the pioneers. 18 years ago, there weren't that many people passionate about food plots here in Michigan yet. No, there there really wasn't. And uh, it just, it, it was... It was my passion. It's something that I enjoy. I love the outdoors, like you said, walleye fishing, steelhead fishing, turkey. You got turkey season coming up. You got food plot season. I mean, just I wanted to bring something that that everybody could enjoy. As people are hearing this show, the broadcast version, the weekend of April twenty third and twenty fourth. Is there something we should be doing now? I mean, is it are we are the we first, jumping the gun, or is it time to get ready? No, the first step that a lot of people overlook is a soil sample. I mean, right now is the time that you want to get your soil sample set it, sent in. Um, that's crucial. You need to know where your pH is. You need to know where your N, P, and K, which is your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. And that it, that's pretty much the first step to having a successful food plot. Stupid question, but why is that important? Because the plants need the right nutrition to produce what individuals are expecting. And if we don't give the plant what it needs, it, it just does not grow to its capability. And it, it could frustrate an individual if they put all the time in for the prep, the seed, and then not have a food plot come in, I feel your first step is a soil sample, for sure. Is this process of food plotting, is it something that takes a while to learn? Can we expect that the first year we do this, we're not going to be successful? No, no, no. I, I mean, it's kind of what you put into it. It's just like everyday activities. If you put your heart and soul into something and you do everything correct, 
it shouldn't be difficult. I, I mean, it should be fun. I mean, that's the biggest thing is we don't want to make this a job. We want to be able to go to our cabin. We want to be able to grab the seat as we go up, go and play on the tractor, four-wheeler, whatever it may be, and just enjoy being out in the outdoors. It, it does kind of take the process of, I'll use deer hunting as an example, but it does kind of make it more of a, a year-round and maybe even a family activity when you're out in the springtime putting in food plots. Everybody can be out there. The kids can be out there. The grandkids can be out there. You don't have to be quiet. Yes, I see what you're saying. It, it, it can be fun. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's supposed to be fun. I mean, that's the whole the whole point of the outdoors is to enjoy it and have fun. Um, that's, I mean, I'm leaving tomorrow to go plant food plots in Kentucky. So, yeah, I mean, I look forward to it every year. Um, I, I run about 30 acres of food plots personally myself, so I'm definitely a big fan of them. I, I feel they're very beneficial um, as long as you kind of think about your surroundings, what you have for farm fields, per se, around your property. Um, there's just a lot of different things to do, to enjoy, and to learn. That's the biggest thing, too, is just to learn, just to experience it. Life's an experience. You experience ups and downs and changes every day. Well, <laughs> that's... That's a very insightful comment. And, yes, that goes well beyond the hunting and fishing world. That goes to life itself. Um, yeah. but, but you also bring up an interesting point. Think about your surroundings. And I've, I've often wondered this, Corey. If you're down in southern Michigan in farm country, why would you even put in a food plot? Because the deer have everything they need all around you. And how are you going to draw them out of the cornfields? Well, that's the biggest. That's, that's the fun part, I think, every year. you got to look at your surroundings. Say, okay, you got... Your thousand acre piece of wood lot that's all connected, neighbors, everybody, and and on the outskirts, you got all your farm fields, you got alfalfa, you have soybeans, you have corn. So you got those three. So you know you have the deer in the general area, and you you want to think what can I plant that's different. You want to give them something different. It's just like it. It's like us eating every day. We don't want to eat the same thing every day. We want a variety. We like different tastes. And and that's where this comes into play. I mean, you can put in a radish blend. You can put in a turnip blend. You can put in a clover blend. You can put so many different things, plant species, available to, per se, just the whitetail. We're just going to talk about whitetail because you can do turkeys, so on and so forth. But... That's that that that's key. So if you were surrounded by corn, you might even want to put in some soybeans if you have no if you have no soybeans around you. So it just depends on your surroundings and what your what equipment you have to work with. What about the size of a food plot? I mean, what's the what's the minimum? What's the maximum? What are we looking at? Well, we'll go back to the first question you asked me. What got me going? So my first food plot, like I said, I used a hand rototiller. It was only 50 feet long, 20 feet wide. And I I shot deer on it, uh, but it was my first food plot. And size doesn't matter. I mean, it it depends if you're going to, if, if you're trying to get them in their in their transition, going from feed to bed, and if you have a food plot in the center, and maybe it per se, it might only be 50 foot by 60 foot, but it's just big enough to get the animal, the animal's attention, to get them to that area, and to get them to stop for just a quick second, maybe just to see it, maybe to harvest it, and that. I don't think there's any too small food plot, and I don't think there's anything too big of a food plot. So, Corey, hang tight. Listen, i got to take a break. Uh, we'll continue the conversation. We're talking with Corey Michek of uh, Northern Edge Food Plots. The website is idealnorthernedge.com, idealnorthernedge.com. 
as you can imagine, I have a lot more questions for Corey because there's a lot there's a lot to talk about here. And he is a good guy to help bring us up to speed on this. So more with Corey Michek of uh, Northern Edge Food Plots. And, of course, we'll wrap it all up with Wild Game Chef extraordinaire Dave Miner. All coming up yet here in the final hour of this week's Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Houghton Lake. On 98.5 WUPS. <laughs> you can hear the show on 98.5 UPS just about everywhere in northern Michigan. Very, very strong signal. You can hear us in Holland on WHTC. That's AM and FM. 14, uh, I mean, like 14.50 AM, 99.7 FM. And you can hear us in Marquette on WDMJ 13.20 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by MUCC's On the Ground program. OTG is a program to improve habitat for fish and wildlife across the state. For details, check out the Michigan United Conservation Club's website. It's MUCC.org. That's MUCC.org. And um, use the promo code MIKE, M-I-K-E, all caps, if you want to save 25% on your MUCC membership. We're talking food plots right now. With Corey Michek of uh, Northern Edge Food Plots, the website IdealNorthernEdge.com, IdealNorthernEdge.com. Uh, Corey, I'm on your website right now looking at the different things here. W- what I'm wondering is, do you have your own brand of seed blends, or are you like a distributor for, for uh, blends from other companies? I'm the creator. We own it. That's our brand, um, all of our own blends. Uh, we manufacture it here in Standish. So a Michigan-based family-owned company. Yep. Yeah, you know I love that. All right, we were talking about <clears throat> food plots, about the size of them. Does the shape matter at all? Hmm. Shape, not per se. I think a shape's going to come out of what an individual has to work with. Um, nobody wants to go in and clear hundreds of trees and if you can work around the trees and they don't shade out the food plot too badly you just kind of work with mother nature and that's what we do on a day-to-day basis yeah food plotting like farming is uh much dependent on mother nature absolutely i mean this is a question that's asked every year is is your seed going to grow well if we don't get rain, and Mother Nature sometimes does that to us, I could sell you a million-dollar pound of seed, and it's not going to grow. I mean, Mother Nature needs to cooperate, and that's one thing that I really preach to individuals when they're doing their food plot or getting ready, is to look at what what's coming at us for weather, especially if it's dry. And if we have in a week of some rain coming, that's when you want to, if you can, Get your food plot into the ground. Something when we have moisture, especially in spring, not so much. It's when we get into our fall plants, our brassicas and stuff like that. July is always dry. And sometimes we get rain, sometimes we don't. August, usually we have some moisture. Um, So that being said, I, I, I pay attention really closely and I kind of, push people to do the same just so the success is higher than lower. You said you're getting ready to head down to Kentucky to put in some food plots. When will you start to put seed in the ground here in Michigan, Corey? Uh, I frost seeded three weeks ago. So I actually put seed in three weeks ago. It was uh, It's just a, uh, a dormant clover plot that it's two years old right now. And this year I just wanted to go through and thicken it up a little bit. And that's uh, that's, that's an easy way to save some time as the frost seed. Clover, switchgrass, um, different things in that nature you can frost seed. Um, now, going, yeah, pretty much about three weeks ago you could start. And then right now once it dries up a little bit, you'll be able to start planting clovers. You can start working your plots if you can get into them. 
You know, I hear clover, brassica, turnips, rye, switchgrass, alfalfa. I mean, there's so many different things out there, Corey. I'm I'm like overwhelmed. I don't I don't know where to start. I don't know what to put in the ground. Well, it goes back to that question you asked of your surroundings. What you have, what you have. I mean, if you have soybeans and corn all around you, you're going to want to try like a clover. You want to. My biggest thing is you don't want to put all your eggs into one basket. You don't want to just go with one thing. And that's why I come out with quarter acre bags. So if a person doesn't know exactly what they want to put in it, say that you got an acre food plot and you go into Jay's or you go into Northwoods or you go into Frank's Great Outdoors and you see all all this different seed and I put it in quarter acre so you can mix it up. I tell people if we don't know what the deer like on your property in the area in Michigan you are, let's try a bunch of different things. Like where you can try collards, radishes, you can put turnips and you can put clover in and you can break it up into four squares. And as you, as hunting season comes and you're in your stand and you can observe and see what, what the whitetail are enjoying at that time of year. So my personal experience, radishes, first, like bow season, they like the moisture, they, they like the, the moisture content in the actual radish. And my, from past years and my experience of seeing this, is it's be, because the ferns start to dry up in the, in the woods. And I feel deer use ferns as a water source because they really contain a lot of water. When you squeeze a fern, water comes right out. And then ferns start to dry out. And then I, the deer start to look for something that's got moisture and good high water content just just for something to drink. Because some places there is no water. You can't, there, there's no water holes, there's no rivers. I understand that we're surrounded by Great Lakes, but there's certain areas that have no water. So that being said, radishes for bow season, clover, collards, you can mix it up. I mean, I'm, I'm not one, I plant multiple different things. I've never been stuck on one item. So our one seed variety per se. Gotcha. You mentioned Jays. Now I I, I want to follow up on this, so I don't forget. This weekend, as folks are hearing this show, you're actually at Jays for a food plot uh, weekend, right? Yes, my yes, yes, we are. We will be there. Well, that's a good thing for folks to check out. So that's this weekend at uh, Jays Sporting Goods. The website jaysportinggoods.com. We're talking with Corey Mechek of uh, Northern Edge Food Plots. His website is idealnorthernedge.com, idealnorthernedge.com. Corey, I got to believe in a state like Michigan, when you're, when, you're, when you're in the food plot business, if you look at the southern tier of states down by Ohio and Indiana and compare that to the UP, man, it's, it's, it's like different worlds, right, as far as food plots. Yeah, for sure, food plot. So that's, that's another thing that comes into play is so the UP, you have a shorter growing period. So you're going to plant a turnip way earlier in the UP than you would down here because the maturity, it's a 62 or 62 to 64 day maturity on a, on a, on a purple top turnip or a New York. And so you need 60 days. And where we are in Standish, you're, you're going to plant later because our growing is longer and as you get as you go south we can go right to kentucky you don't want to plant a food plot of any brassicas in kentucky until september because their growing goes so much longer it's so much warmer there so yes as you said planting dates are different based on where you are throughout the state. So that is that that is definite um, something that you want to pay attention to. You mentioned something a couple of minutes ago too. I want to go back to this quarter acre bag. That sounds pretty pretty interesting and maybe a, a good way for somebody a newbie just getting started to break into this whole food plot deal. Absolutely. I mean, the whole thing when when I started this, well, I wanted to have 
something available to individuals that it's not everybody can afford it and that's why i come out with the blends that i have and i have them priced i just it it, it everything it evolved anymore uh, around cost of goods like right now we got fuel everything the cost for us to do anything anymore is just outrageous and this year is going to be really bad i mean we got fertilizer that is thirty dollars a bag that used to be 12 we have lime that used to be four dollars a bag now it's seven and just everything keeps going up but i'm trying to keep the seed prices down so we can all afford it and enjoy the outdoors that we have available to us what about supply i mean like everything else can you get fertilizer can you get lime can you do you have seed we have all the seed we've We've been bringing it in since the first of the year. Fertilizer, we've been bringing it in since last year, trying to make sure that we have supply for everyone. And it's going to be an interesting year, especially for the fertilizer and lime. And that goes right back to what I said, soil sample. So some people's soil is going to be it's going to need a lot of lime and a lot of fertilizer. And it's going to be costly depending on what what we want to do and where people's budgets are what what it just it, there's a lot of different things that's going to come into play this year and that being said we'll just see what happens uh, absolutely Corey. real quick before i let you go and run out of time here do you uh i know you offer seed do you also offer consultation do you go out and actually put in food plots for people what's the scope of the business um, I, I don't personally plant food plots. I have people that do that that I recommend. So if anybody's looking for an individual um, for a complication of putting food plots in on their property, you can reach out to, out to us through our website, and I can point you in the direction of a habitat manager. Fair enough. And that website is idealnorthernedge.com, idealnorthernedge.com, the website of Northern Edge Food Plots. Uh, Corey Michek, listen, I appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, I contacted you kind of out of the blue and you stepped up and you did a great job. And I can't thank you enough. Well, I look forward. I, I appreciate the opportunity and I, I look forward to doing this again with you. All right. Well, look, uh, that's something we'll certainly do. Corey Michek of uh, Northern Edge Food Plots. Again, the website, idealnorthernedge.com, idealnorthernedge.com. And as you are hearing the radio show this weekend, the 23rd and 24th, Jay Sporting Goods, I, at least the Jay's and Claire, is having a food plot weekend. Corey or one of his people will be there along with representatives from several other food plot uh, companies as well. So be sure to check that out. We'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. A few more things to talk about. And, of course, you know we'll come back after that and wrap it all up with Wild Game Chef extraordinaire Dave Miner. That's right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Manistee on WMLQ 97.7 FM. You can hear us in uh, Iron Mountain on WMIQ 1450 AM. And you can hear us in Saginaw on WSGW AM and FM 790 AM 100.5 FM. I'm in the studios of WSGW right now. One small corner of the building as the sun is coming through the the window here for just a few minutes. Uh, Pat Johnston was in here with me earlier, the award-winning Pat Johnston, sports broadcaster. Now I'm in here with the revered and award-winning Charlie Root. And because it's so nice out, there is a throng, a throng of people in the parking lot cheering him on. Charlie, Charlie. It's amazing. He has more people... He has more fans from this show than I do. Charlie, appreciate your help very much. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Reader Landscaping. Reader can take care of your lawn and property because it's your nature and our nurture. Let Reader create an outdoor getaway in your backyard as they have for me. And the folks at Reader have been busy around my house this past week. 
They were over early in the week to uh, trim up some of our ornamental trees right uh, uh, at the uh, corners of the house. You know, I just like them to stay nice and tight and not rubbing against the house. And the guys from Reader come over every year, maybe sometimes twice a year, to trim them up and make them look nice. I did that one year myself. I, I, I can kind of do it, you know, if I get up on a ladder and some pruning stuff and, you know, I can do it. But it sure is a lot easier to have them do it. And they do a better job, too. And then they were out two days later to do a spring cleanup. Again, I could do it, but it sure saved me time, and it sure made my back feel better by having those guys do it. And now next week they're coming out to open up the uh, the water, turn on the sprinkler system and open up the water feature on the patio. So I trust these folks. I've used them for several projects. They've helped me out with several projects. They do a great job for me and I'm confident they will for you as well. But here's the thing. Now that the season is really, really starting to be in full uh, swing here, if you've got something, something you want done this year, contact them now. First come, first serve, they say. The website, readerlandscaping.com, readerlandscaping.com, R-E-D-E-R, readerlandscaping.com. Oh, let's see, where are we at here? This is, as you are hearing this show... Uh, the opening weekend of Michigan's turkey season. You know I love turkey hunting. Um, I'm not sure that I will be in the turkey woods as you are hearing this. In fact, it's looking like I will probably be in an airplane as the birds start to gobble opening, uh, opening morning. So I'm really glad that I have season ZZ, which is a long season. It's like five weeks, almost six weeks. It runs from April, uh, April 23rd all the way through the end of May, the mosquito season. So <laughs> I, I, I wonder if the birds will be thinking about me as much as I am about them. <laughs> oh, I've been out shooting my crossbow, getting ready, uh, shooting a dart and crossbow. I'm going to shoot the uh, Michigan-made REC broadheads, R-E-K, REC expandable heads. I shot a uh, bear with them uh, last, late last summer. Did a really, really good job. They fly great. Um, so I'm really looking forward to putting one of these uh, through a turkey to see how they perform there. I'm confident it'll do a wonderful job. Uh, I will be set up in uh, my see-through ground blind that I love from Primal Tree Stands, Wraith 270. Uh, when I do get back in town, that's the first thing I'm going to do, honestly. Uh, uh, you know, get back in town, um, unpack, and head for the woods. I can't wait. Can't wait. Uh, so what else is going on? Um, Brenton. Brenton, USA, hunting rifles. Michigan-based, AR-style, extremely accurate rifles. You will pay for that accuracy, though. I'm going to tell you right now. It's, uh, they're, they're not an inexpensive gun. They're not a cheap gun. And they're certainly not at the high end. I mean, you can pay three, four, five times more for a gun. Uh, but the folks at Brenton know that you know, they, are, they are a high quality, somewhat of a high dollar uh, a product. So to help out with that, they put a promo code in, and it's Avery. If you go to BrentonUSA.com, BrentonUSA.com, and you can buy right online. Uh, use the promo code Avery. You can save a hundred bucks right off the bat. A hundred bucks. So that helps, right? That's a nice, nice little incentive there. Uh, it's and and I ordered a, a 350 Legend from Brenton. Uh, it's now done. I haven't seen it. I haven't picked it up yet. We hope to hear in the next oh, few weeks, several weeks, do a Wednesday night live with that gun uh, on a range somewhere. They give me a feel for, for how it shoots and get to know the gun and to, to show you a little bit about what these guns are about as well. Um, I've been picking up uh, 350 Legend ammo whenever I get a chance. Uh, speaking of picking things up, picking things up, have you been out picking up Nightcrawlers? Springtime tradition here in Michigan. A lot cheaper than buying them. And no, I don't have my Angler Quest yet. She's coming. And when she gets here, it'll be uh, more than worth the wait. But in the meantime, there are turkeys to be chased. There are bows to be shot. There are guns to be shot. And eventually, there will be walleyes to be caught. Not walleyes, walleye. There is no plural for walleye. Did you know that? 
A walleye is a walleye, and ten walleye are still walleye. There's no S on the end of walleyes. It's like deer. There's no deers. They're deer. Little fun fact here in the Outdoor Magazine show. When we come back, we'll wrap it all up with Wild Game Chef extraordinaire Dave Miner right here on Outdoor Magazine. Welcome back to Outdoor Magazine. My name is Mike Avery. It is a pleasure, an honor, a blessing to sit at this microphone each week for three hours. And the fact that you are sharing some of your valuable time with me means a lot. I do certainly appreciate it. I also appreciate the fact that I've been able to work with just top quality people over the years. Uh, including my good friend, wild game chef extraordinaire, Dave Miner, who helps us wrap up every show. And guess what? He's here once again. He's, he's just like a clock, just like clockwork. When it gets to be the end of the show, there is Chef Dave Miner, and I hear his voice, and I know he's here once again. Welcome back, my friend. How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing great. I'm doing just great, and I've been thinking about something. I think we agreed to do a turkey recipe this week, and I can't wait to hear which one you've got. Uh, have you been out in Turkey Woods? We don't want to talk about that. <laughs> okay. I th- I think I that, that they, there there was some uh, yeah I've been out looking I've been out scouting, but this weekend as folks are hearing this show sh- was supposed to be my opening day. There were some family plans that got in the way, but uh, oh. I, I, I will be out there soon. You can you can count on that. I was walking around the pond looking in the sand, and I didn't see uh, not one track where I normally see the birds, you know, strutting and all of that. But, hey, anyway. Isn't it, inter- come- isn't it interesting, though, that, I mean, from one, from one year to another, like where I'm, where I'm hunting, last year there were no birds this time of year. I ended up seeing them later in the season. And this year they're all over the place. Isn't it interesting how it changes yep. from year to year? Yep, yep, yep. So, anyways, let's talk about Mike Avery's peppered turkey Oh, steak. yes. Steak up wav. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so this is going to be for four portions. You need about eight to ten ounces of uh, breast meat per person. You're going to cut it across the grain. You'll need one jar of turkey gravy or chicken gravy, a small onion diced up real fine, a couple cloves of dar- garlic, more or less to your flavor. Uh, chop that up fine couple ounces of heavy cream, a splash of bourbon, as much or as little as you like. It really adds to the flavor, so I would suggest using it. You can buy them little airline bottles. 12 ounces of uh, mushroom and a lot of whole peppercorns that we're going to tell you how to crush it up real good, olive oil and flour. So I was saying you got to cut them turkey steaks across the grain, about an inch and a half thick or so. So you can, for four portions on a nice big bird, you can get, um, two meals for four people off of each breast lobe, and you can stretch that out after, you know, for a while instead of just cooking it up and eating at one time. So what you want to do is check for shot, any bloodied meat in, trim that off real nice and well, good good trim job. Use heavy uh, plastic like a bread bag works good, but always make sure that you put the um, printing or the paint on the outside. You don't want to drive any of that uh, into the meat so um so you can take oh and you know meat mallet or a really heavy bottle you can do that pound it down to about an inch half inch thick if you're starting off with an inch and a half thick steak pound it down to about a half inch this is going to break up the tissue so it won't pucker up if you don't do this and it's going to have a tendency to draw up under heat so you want to make sure you get it pounded out real good or else you're going to end up with just almost like a ball sometimes. So you to crush the pepper, you're going to put it between um, two pieces of that plastic, uh, and you can use your meat mallet on the flat side, pound it down, or you can take a pan uh, that's not so shiny like a stainless steel pan, more of like a, oh, one of the blackening pans you use, like a Griswold and crush it. Just keep pushing down and crushing it. So you want to get it a li- little bit bigger pieces than ground up, you know. So press this into the two sides of the meat. Squeeze it in really, really good with your fingers. 
dredge it in flour in a real hot pan. You want to brown both sides. When it's nice and golden brown, flip it over, do the same thing. Leave those peppercorns in the bottom of the pan. Add the onions, the garlic, the mushrooms, the gravy, the heavy cream, the bourbon. Heat it up real fast. Taste it. If it's to your liking, spoon it over the uh, steaks. Make it 350 degrees uncovered. You want to reduce that uh, liquid down so you get a lot of good flavor in it. And after about an hour, check it. You can take two forks like, and take a corner of that uh, steak and try to pull it apart if you can. Then it's ready. But if not, cook it longer. You know, it might uh, take another 20 minutes or a half hour, depending on the age of the bird, too. That makes a big difference. And it's Mike is a pepper freak, and so we call this Mike Avery's Peppered Turkey Steaks. And I will take that. I will take that title, and I will gladly have a a meal named after me because you're the guy who got me started in this. I've always loved pepper, but I never knew about the concept of a poivre and cracked peppercorns pushed into the meat before, Dave, and now I'm absolutely addicted on it. So thank you for that, my friend. You know, when that pepper hits a real hot pan, it does something with the aromatic flavor, and I think it takes some of the heat away, but makes flavor, and it's so aromatic when you're doing this. It's wonderful. I love it, you know. Well, thank you for uh, introducing me to that concept, David. Good luck in the turkey woods. Thanks for the recipe. We'll talk to you next time, my friend. Good luck to yourself, Michael. All right, I appreciate that. Wild Game Chef extraordinaire Dave Miner, a big part of the Outdoor Magazine show. As are you. I say this every week, and I sincerely and truly mean this. If you didn't listen to the broadcast version of the show or the podcast version of the show, if you didn't follow me online, I couldn't do this. My website, by the way, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. My email address, Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. I'm also on social media. Love to talk to you there, and I will talk with you next time right here on Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine.